Well, thank you very much and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this special joint presentation from CETA and RIOS looking at energy dynamics, security, gas and power prices. I'm Paul Willis, director of RIOS, and I'll be your host. Within the previous decade, we've seen here in Australia and around the world the rollout of new gas extraction technologies that have allowed access to previously inaccessible reserves of hydrocarbon gas and oil. This has radically changed the global picture of the supply of energy and raises questions of energy security here in Australia. So what exactly are these new technologies and how do they work? In what ways have uh, access to these new energy sources impacted the world supply? And what will we see in the future as these gas supplies come on tap? Here to provide some clarity and insight into the new energy dynamics, the security, gas and power prices are MD and CEO of Santos, David Knox, and UCL lecturer and Chatham House professor, Paul Stevens. Please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> this discussion is being relayed live via our live stream as well as on the APAC channel. Questions for the end of the session can be submitted via the chat roll of the live stream and on Twitter using the hashtag #EnergyFuture. Uh, I would think a good place to start, gentlemen, would actually be to get some definitions and some clarity about what we're actually talking about. Because, well, let's start from the difference between conventional and unconventional gas. What is the difference? I mean, I'm speaking as an economist and keep it very simple. With conventional gas, you drill a hole in the ground and the gas flows in commercial quantities. With unconventional gas, you drill a hole in the ground, something else has to be done, something else has to happen to make it commercially viable, to make it flow. You satisfied with that definition, David? Um, yeah, I, I think the definition isn't particularly important. The key thing here is that whether you produce it conventional or unconventional, it's really about producing it from the rocks, and it's always, it's basically methane we're talking about, uh, CH4. And as Paul says, there are some rocks that they, they give up their gas without um, too much effort or hard work, and there are other rocks that we have to work much harder on. Of course, the famous rocks that everyone's talking about now being shale. But they're still, both, both are producing methane, and it's just a matter of ultimately, what technologies do we use to gain access to that methane that's in the ground? So to those technologies, the two technologies that I've uh, come across that need some explanation, one is uh, fracturing or fracking, but also horizontal drilling. Is horizontal drilling as simple as it sounds? <laughs> is it just drilling horizontally rather than vertically? Well, you have to drill vertically first. And once you drill vertically, you then kick it off into a horizontal lateral. And I think the world record at the moment held for a lateral is about... 18 kilometers, 20 kilometers, something of like that. Although this is changing by the day because they, uh, the, the, the technology is moving so fast. That doesn't sound like an easy thing to do, David. Um, well, the oil and gas industry has been drilling horizontally um, probably yeah. for certainly 30 or 40 years. I drilled my first horizontal in the North Sea um, probably in 1984, 1985. It was the first time I did one. And, and basically, Paul's absolutely right. You, you basically, you know, build angle and then in the reservoir you just keep going um, um, flat and you try. The, the real skill in drilling horizontal though, is then this is the fun bit, is doing something called geo, geo steering. Because what you do is you, you in fact use tools in the bit, just behind the bit, that allow you to look up and down. And effectively you can see where the ceiling of the reservoir is and if you're really lucky you can sometimes see the floor. And you try and keep as close to the ceiling as you can typically. Um, so you don't want to pop out the reservoir because that would be basically drilling just rock with no hydrocarbon. So you try and steer as the ceiling goes up and down, you try and steer the well along. And um, the really big horizontals that are, are, are drilled are maybe 10,000 feet uh, um, horizontal is, a, is a, a fairly big horizontal. Here in, in, in uh, South Australia, we've just drilled one that's uh, basically 3,000 feet or uh, one and a bit K um, of horizontal section. So um, it, it's a common technique. Um, and what it allows you to do, of course, is if you drill vertically, you just get this amount. If you drill horizontally, you, you, you expose so much more rock. 
you get so much more opportunity to access the gas that's in that rock. And also, you can use this technique for oil as well. Mm. Um, and fracturing, that's where you submit the rocks to high pressure to break them so that you, they release the gas. And you also pump sand in there to keep those fractures open, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's water, sand and chemicals injected at very high pressure to fracture the, scale, the, 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 the shale. And again, like horizontal drilling, this is not new technology. I think the first well was fracked in the United States in 1947. So it's been around for quite some time. And uh, just lastly, um, David, coal seam gas, shale gas, and tight gas, they're not the same, are they? Well, they come from different rocks, but it's the same gas, same methane. Um, the only issue with them is that makes them slightly different is not all gas is exactly the same. Sometimes you get some heavier hydrocarbons, uh, which is typically good news economically. Other times, uh, say in coal seam gases case, it's pure methane. Uh, you very rarely get uh, any other hydrocarbons with it. But in the Cooper Basin here in South Australia, we do get the heavier ends. In fact, we get condensate as well with, with our gas. And it's actually in, in this state, uh, in South Australia, it's the condensate that's actually driven the economics for mm. us. The gas has, has not had such strong economics. It's the fact that we get effectively something very akin to petrol coming out uh, mm. with the gas that that's really what's driven the, uh, the wealth um, here with coal seam gas, you can get a natural flow, so it can be a conventional source, or you can use un uh, unconventional techniques, but the other two, uh, shale gas and tight gas, you do need to use new technologies to get I, the gas out? Yeah, for all of them, you use different techniques to extract the gas, but in, in the coal seam gas space, you just need to lower the bottom hole pressure. If the coals are fully saturated, in other words, they, they contain as much gas as they possibly can, as soon as you start to lower the bottom hole pressure, they, the gas starts to dissolve or dissolve actually from the coals and it comes into the well bore at atmospheric pressure, comes up the well bore and then you've got to gather it and then you've got to compress it to transport it. In shale, you're much deeper. Rather than a kilometre deep in coal seam gas, you're th here again, I'll just talk about South Australia, we're three kilometres deep. Um, and um, there it's, um, it's really very, very hard rock we're in. There's very, very few natural fractures. You have to create those natural fractures, as you say, through fracking. Uh, and ultimately, through uh, fracking, what we do is we do pump sand, some form of a gel which supports the sand, otherwise it would just settle out in the bottom, which would be no good to anyone. So we carry a carrying gel, and basically we create fractures which are only six to 10 sand grains wide. So they imagine six to 10 sand grains wide, they're very narrow, and they go out from the well bore. If we get it right, they go out from the well bore for maybe 10 to 20 meters if we get it right. If we get it wrong, we just, they just wrap themselves around the well bore or don't go where we want them to. Um, but they basically go out from the well bore, and that, what that does is it opens up rock faces, you can imagine. It just opens it up, and then the gas or oil can flow into those fractures, slowly through the fractures and up the well bore. <coughs> but very often in that situation, Paul, as you were saying, it comes out under a bit more pressure. When you get to the surface, there's a bit more surface pressure. <coughs> Colcine gas is virtually no surface pressure. Now, just a, a brief history of the, the current rollout of, uh, of uh, the unconventional gas, uh, as well as the in, improved uh, circumstances for conventional gas. Uh, while the technologies, as you rightly point out, do stre uh, stretch back many decades, it was really only in the late 2000s that in the US they started to encourage a lot of small drillers to exploit unconventional gas deposits. P pick up the story. What happened and what sort of impact did we see? Do you mind if I show, show a slide? Yeah, please. Um, can I have my second slide? If that's possible. So uh, what this, this slide shows, um, I think, and, and Paul will obviously add some color to this as well, is I chose this one because it shows on the, in the blue the rise of uh, effectively shale gas in the United States. This is completely extraordinary. Um, Ten years ago, really, we weren't talking about it. We certainly didn't believe that this resource even existed um, in any large quantities. People have been looking uh, for many, many years, but nobody had, had really believed it would reach this level. And you can just see how it's taken off. What drove that uh, extraordinary um, change was, as you can see, I, I just plotted the Henry Hub gas price. So Henry Hub gas prices have been trotting along at about $4 for a very, very long time. And they started to, to lift up. And they, they, in fact, on a particular month, got to $12, $13. 
but these are averages for the year. You can see they went up, they effectively doubled. What that drove over a period of time in 2005 onwards is it drove people to get the drill bit out. It drove people to say, this is valuable, let's find out what technologies we can use. And we went up to about 1,700 rigs drilling in North America. So extra extraordinary increase in the number of rigs. What happened then, of course, technology kicked in, they started to find out how to do it, they found the sweet spots, and they started to unlock this amazing resource of shale gas. And in turn, that has driven the increase in the blue. And ultimately, it started to bring the prices back down the other side. And we're now back to a $4 well. Uh, to carry on from this, Paul, the US led the way. How did it unroll internationally? Well, the, the short answer is that it hasn't yet. Uh, there's a lot of optimism in various parts of the world that they're about to experience an equivalent shale gas revolution. What they tend to focus on, however, is, is what's happened to shale gas production in the US since about 2006. And as you can see from the, gra the, the, the graph, it's increased very dramatically. But in fact, the revolution's been over 25 years in the making. Um, one of the things that did kick it off was in the 1980s and the 1990s, the US government spent a huge amount of R&D money into low permeability operation. Now, this is basic scientific research. This is the sort of basic scientific research that private companies wouldn't and shouldn't do. The government did it and then made the results uh, available. As I say, there's a lot of other parts of the world that are getting enthusiastic about this, particularly in Europe, particularly since the events in Crimea, uh, as you can imagine. But the problem is that the, the, there are a lot of barriers outside of the United States. If you look at the circumstances in the United States, you can come up with a long list of very specific characteristics. For example, the issue of property rights, who owns the, the subsoil hydrocarbon, which explains why the US had its revolution. When you apply those characteristics to other parts of the world, it doesn't look so promising at the moment. Um, well, here in Australia, or even in our state, South Australia, what's the picture been for the rollouts? So um, here in South Australia, uh, and it goes through into Queensland as well, um, this is the, the excitement, is can we do the same thing that occurred in North America? So clearly we're bringing uh, North American style technology here. Well, we have some of the very best American companies uh, uh, providing services to us here in Australia. We're seeking to grow the scale. But we are very, um, very young in this. Um, my company has just drilled two horizontal wells. Um, and uh, obviously when we've drilled 20 or 30, we'll probably really start to have the answer. But we, we've drilled two big ones, and um, we'll bring them on test this year and see how well they flow. We've got three or four vertical wells flowing. Um, one in particular has now been flowing for um, a bit more than 18 months, another one we've just brought on. They are flowing gas from the shale formation. So the question is whether um, we can do what's happened in North America. I think at the end of the day, um, I'm confident we will be able to do it when we apply the right technology, and it'll probably take us a few years to unlock that. But in, you know, at the same time, we're also unlocking all the other gas that we've got in, in Australia. And Australia is blessed with gas. You know, we're very fortunate. Whether you talk about Western Australia, whether you talk about Eastern Australia, we have a lot of gas in what you might describe conventional reservoirs, our, um, our reservoirs that we've exploited for the last 40 years in the center of Australia, in the Cooper Basin, and of course, ultimately, in the new coal seam gas reservoirs, which are proving to be very, very prolific. The scale of what we're talking about, I understand that, uh, that in Australia, unconventional gas will add by half our understanding of the conventional gas reserves and that we could be looking at an ex export market of about $53 billion a year? Yeah, the numbers are very large and you can get lost in them, but effectively um, you can say that Australia right now is blessed with a lot of gas and half of that gas is probably in conventional reservoirs and the other half is probably in how we describe unconventional, which could be coal seams or it could be the, the shale. So about half and half perhaps right now. And yes, Australia by 2017, 2018, we will export um, a very similar quantity of liquid natural gas, which is just gas at a minus 161 centigrade. It's a very cold gas, which forms a liquid at that level. We will export exactly the same amount, roughly, as Gatar does, which is 80 million tons a year. Um, the demand of the whole of Japan right now is about 85 million tons a year. 
So that's enough gas to supply the whole of the Japanese market if you were supplying one market, which is an extraordinary amount. And of course, this will go for 20 or 30 years. So it creates um, a very large um, long-term stream of revenues, both for, uh, for Australian companies, but obviously also for the Australian government. On a global picture with respect to the supply of energy, uh, Paul, is this new stuff that's coming on the market, is it displacing some traditional sources of energy? Well, certainly in the United States, um, the increase in shale gas production that we've been talking about has been pushing out coal. Um, one of the consequences of that, of course, is that the U.S. carbon footprint has fallen significantly. However, they are exporting the coal to Europe. So the carbon footprint in Europe has increased accordingly. So from a global point of view, there's not a great deal of difference. But it, it, it is having an impact. But there is growing concern when people look at the potential for gas and say, here is a transition fuel uh, towards a lower carbon economy. And insofar as gas is pushing coal out, then this is good news from a climate change point of view. But people are beginning to say, well, hang on a minute, do we need all this expensive renewables if we have access to a lot of low carbon gas? And that's dangerous because if, if gas is pushing renewables out of the picture, that is not good news from a climate change point of view. Would you agree with that, Danny? Well, can I just um, get, get some facts in the room and just go to my uh, third uh, slide that I had? Um, this is, I think, in, in one um, slide, is sort of the grand experiment that's taken place. Um, the same shale gas rise that you see in the blue that I showed you on the, the price. But this time, I've plotted um, US's carbon emissions. So currently, the emissions of carbon in the United States are back down to 1994 levels. And half of the reduction in emissions has come from the sw switching, as, um, as Paul said, from coal to gas. The other half has come from the introduction of perhaps a bit more nuclear and a bit more renewables into the mix. But you can see that as America has managed to lower its, its emissions. And it's through a combination, I think, of pulling some levers. You've only got four levers you can pull. You've got the renewable lever, you've got the gas lever, you can pull the coal lever, or you can pull the nuclear lever. And it's the combination which you choose as a country and as a nation to pull those levers, which will ultimately determine your carbon footprint. I would um, argue that the, the levers we should be pulling right now is a combination of gas and, and, uh, and renewables, combined, of course, with a reasonable amount of nuclear, as depending upon your geologic setting and, and the, the politics in the nation at any one time. But those are, the, those are the two levers which will deliver the lowest reduction. And on a grand scale, you can see they've done it in America. You, you've missed out a rather crucial lever, which is efficiency. Uh, efficiency uh, which is very is, important, is, I agree. can be very, very important. I agree, I agree. I, and, and, and there's another lever in there, of course, and that's the switch from, uh, of transport fuels from the higher intensity transport fuels to, say, to lower intensity transport mm. fuels, which is what we're starting to see, in, in, again, in North America. And, when we see Walmart go away from gasoline in their trucks to using natural gas in their trucks, then we'll start to see the next, the next drop in emissions. So I agree entirely. Uh, emissions is really important. Coming back to I'm sorry, efficiency is really important. Yeah. Coming back to the, the domestic side of uh, the equation, um, what effect is it going to have if we shackle our gas production to an export market? What's the domestic supply and domestic prices, what's going to happen there? Well, <laughs> this is a controversial area. Um, if you start to produce a lot of gas domestically, uh, then in theory the price should go down. However, if you're going to start exporting that gas, then of course that is going to push the gas price down elsewhere rather than in Australia. Uh, which gives rise to the whole issue of reservation policies, which is a, is a controversial area. Uh, the idea that you retain some of the domestic production for, uh, for domestic consumption. Uh, the problem with that is if you do that, you really are starting to interfere with the market, uh, which sometimes is necessary because markets fail all over the place. Uh, but the danger is if you are having a reservation policy, this may well res remove the incentive for companies to go out and find gas if the only place they can sell it is in a low-priced domestic market. So the 
price, uh, another way of looking at that is that the domestic price for gas is artificially low. Um, what's the difference between a domestic price for gas at the moment and uh, an international price? Well, um, I think a um, very good point made around uh, gas prices is that if we weren't allowed to export gas from this country, then we would be reducing our gas supply. I would not be able to recommend to my board making an investment decision on the basis of um, three to four dollar gas. It's simply not economic. So what I'm about is increasing supply. And the way we've done uh, uh, increasing supply in the east, uh, eastern states here of, of um, Australia is by building liquid natural gas plants, which allow us to gain access to a much higher priced um, uh, Asian markets. So when I sell um, a unit of gas into Tokyo Bay right now, I sell it for $14.50. When I sell a unit of gas today into, say, Sydney, Melbourne, or Adelaide, I sell it for about $4. So you can see there's a very large arbitrage between those two numbers. So what I'm able to do by um, investing, in our case, uh, $18.5 billion to do it, we're able to now get it into Tokyo Bay. What that does is it will drive an extraordinary um, opportunity for companies such as myself, or Santos, the one I work for, to invest in gas in Australia. So we're bringing in new technology, we're bringing in people, we're bringing in expertise to unlock our resources. And had we not been able to export it, or had we been restricted in those exports, we wouldn't have been able to do those things. We would still be stuck in a 3 to $4 world here in Australia, and basically, the Cooper Basin, which is our key asset that's been on stream for the last 40 years, would have continued in gracious decline. I'm glad to say that that's not the case, and that now we're investing very substantially in the Cooper Basin to increase the supply. And um, I, ha I now have a choice to supply the domestic market or the international market. We will do both, of course. Um, Answering the direct question of where Australian, East Australian gas prices will go to, we've been very clear for about two to three years that we expect them to rise from, say, the three to four dollar range to the six to nine dollar range, and that's what I'm seeing. Um, I anticipate, however, though, that um, if we have the US shale experience, that we'll be able to bring them back down the other side as we start to really increase supply, and that'll, that'll drive prices down. And that's the ambition, and um, that's very much where I hope that we'll be able to go. And in doing so, also drive down emissions. This is a special joint presentation of CEDA and RIOS looking at energy dynamics, security, gas and power prices. I'm Paul Willis, your host, and I'm joined by MD CEO of Santos, David Knox, and UCL lecturer and Chatham House professor, St Paul Stevens. Um, I just want to quickly go through the situation with oil and liquid uh, hydrocarbon supply. In Australia, we've got a problem, haven't we? Well, I think my sense is that yes, in terms of domestic supply, uh, it has been falling. There's been no new discoveries of any note, um, and the prospects are that the, the domestic crude supply will fall. Uh, refineries are, are closing. That makes sense to a degree. If you don't have domestic crude oil, it probably makes more sense to import products than import crude oil and then refine it in rather old, outdated refineries. Uh, one of the interesting dimensions, however, of the, of the new tech, well, the, it's not new technology, but the technology associated with shale gas, is when you apply that technology to, to what are called fallow oil fields. These are oil fields that people walked away from some time ago because it's assumed that they'd maximise recovery. If you apply the technology to that, the oil starts to flow again, providing the economics are right. So it could well be that this sort of horizontal drilling and factoring could well lead to a, a revival of domestic Australian supply without necessarily having large new discoveries. And this has actually happened in the States, hasn't it, David, that uh, a, a number of companies that went out looking for gas ended up, through unconventional techniques, producing more oil. Yes, um, th there's lots of techniques where you can produce more oil. One of them is horizontal drilling, which we've already talked about. Another is CO2 flooding, where you actually take CO2, you put it back in the ground in a liquid form, and it pushes the oil in front of it. So that's uh, tertiary recovery, which has been very effective in certain parts of Texas. And they, in fact, bring CO2 all the way down from Colorado all the way into Texas to do this. So a lot of people don't realize that we, we are able to use co 2 different viscosity to push oil out. It's, it's absolutely true, though, here in Australia, it's, a, it's basically, and really almost in Asia, it's a, it's a gassy region. We have more gas than we have oil. 
But as a CEO of, a, of an oil and gas company, we continue to, to look for oil. And um, here, in, again, referring to South Australia, South Australia today is producing more oil than it has in the last 40 years. So there is more oil coming down to Port Bernaithen uh, recently than we have done over the last 40 years. There's 50,000 barrels a day today. Now, that's come about because there's been quite a bit of investment in the Cooper Basin, uh, and a number of companies have unlocked uh, the oil fields on the western flank very effectively. Um, Beach, Drill, Search, and Senex in particular, combining with my own company, Santos, we've also increased our oil production. So the, it's not the end of the story here, but uh, as you'll rightly say, it is more gassy than oily, but we always continue to look for oil. But the, the impact in the U.S. has been absolutely amazing. I mean, the joke amongst oil analysts in 2011 was that the next member of OPEC would be North Dakota. That's uh, right. And, and North Dakota now actually produces more oil than Qatar or, or Ecuador. So it is having a very significant impact, and it will spread beyond the United States to other parts of the world, areas, for example, like the North Sea, uh, where people have regarded the, the decline as terminal. That could be turned around with the, with the, the use of the technology. So again, it might be just worth saying, how on earth did that occur? You know, North America is about to become uh, oil independent. Now, how could that possibly occur? You know, you remember George Bush saying many years ago, we've got to wean ourselves off hydrocarbons. Well, bloomin' heck, he's managed to uh, get to a situation North America has where they're self-sufficient almost in oil. It occurred due to this extraordinary horizontal mm. drilling oh, yeah. and unlocking the shales, and then the oil was contained in the shales. Yeah. It was absolutely an amazing story. It's worth pointing out, though, that the reduction in oil imports into the U.S., at least half of that is down to efficiency gains and rather efficient. than yep. increased supply as a result of, of caffeine, improved cafe Going standards. back to the, the supply of, of oil problem in Australia, though, the, the sector that's going to most heavily feel that is the transport sector, which underpins many other sectors of the economy. Um, should we be looking at transferring dependence on oil to a greater dependence on, on gas for the transport se uh, sector? Or Well, the, 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 when how you, should we deal with the problem? When you, buy, well, um, when you buy gasoline right now, you, you are buying effectively off the rack price in Singapore. You've all, we've always, Australians, been doing that for a long time. That's, it's, the, it's the price of gasoline off the, out of the, refined, the big refineries in Singapore that sets our, our uh, gasoline price, um, combined with, of course, the exchange rate. The opportunity is there, um, however, to perhaps do something to delink that by, by using more um, um, either uh, liquid natural gas or compressed natural gas in more uh, vehicles. And big trucks in particular lend themselves to this, as do trains. Um, and again, in North America, and other, again, some of the very big truck companies here are considering going to um, using much more uh, basic gas as the fundamental fuel. We already supply quite a lot of uh, um, um, LPGs, um, which people run their vehicles on uh, here in South Australia. And extraordinarily, extraordinarily, if you go to a city like Cairo, which probably many of you have done over many years, and had a look at how say, a city like Cairo powers itself, it, it uses compressed natural gas. Almost all the vehicles in Cairo are compressed natural gas, mm. which is amazing. And uh, so I think it is an opportunity to change the transport mix away from the higher emitting to the, the more uh, to gas again. The, the, uh, the problem is to, to make that sort of change requires a very large amount of investment yeah. in, in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the reasons for doing that in urban areas, and Cairo is a good example of this, is if you start to use compressed natural gas, it dramatically reduces particulate pollution. And if you've seen some recent pictures coming out of Beijing, uh, a good dose of CNG in Beijing transport would do a lot to improve that. I just want to touch on uh, another area, uh, and that is the questions of regulation, uh, <laughs> before we go to questions. So, ladies and gentlemen, do have your questions uh, ready um, for asking. But uh, I read that UK regulators have learned from the US experience and state that rigorous regulation is the cornerstone of successful mining of shale gas. Paul, what do they mean? Well, in, in the UK and in Europe generally, there are a lot of regulations covering shale gas operations to do with environment, to do with waste disposal, etc., etc. The problem is, 
communities in Western Europe have become very anti the whole shale gas operations, and they basically need reassuring. And it was actually the Royal Society study on shale gas operations last year that recommended in order to keep communities, give them confidence, ideally you need a specific regulatory regime for shale with a very strong independent regulator. Now I know that very often the industry, for the industry, the only good regulation is a dead regulation, um, but this is an effect, it's a PR exercise to reassure people that the legitimate concerns over aspects of shale gas operations are being taken seriously. The UK government, however, is not going that route. They've said, no, there's enough regulation out there. But there are elements, and as I say, I quote the Royal Society on this, that suggest that a specific regulatory regime would enhance public confidence. Here in Australia, David, where it's a more complicated picture because a lot of the regulations are state-based because the extraction of minerals is uh, administered by the state rather than the federal government. So with that patchwork of regulations for you to operate under, that must make life difficult? Yeah, I think the, the key thing here to say, um, as someone who works in all the states of, uh, of Australia and offshore, is we do have uh, many different um, regulatory environments in which we work in. I'm not of the opinion that, uh, that we should be um, pushing back in regulations. I'm absolutely of the opinion that we should have very high quality, uh, well-designed, well-constructed regulatory frameworks. Um, and I'm 100% supportive of doing that. It's in absolutely the best interest of the industry and, and the public and, um, and the politicians that we have a really strong, um, high-quality uh, regulatory environment. My only push on regulations, and it is a big push, is that we should only have to do it once. So uh, I've given the example before that in Queensland, we had to um, apply for environmental approvals for the, our LNG uh, system, our liquid natural gas uh, export system. And it was a 65 kilogram environmental assessment, which was done, which of course is ludic ludicrously large. But then to, to make that even more um, uh, unwieldy, we had to do it again for um, the Commonwealth government. So it's obvious that to do something like that twice is just plain um, not, not sensible. And I'm very, very pleased that the Commonwealth government and it, certainly the state of Queensland are now working together to make sure that they determine who does that and who does it well and just do it once and then the, uh, whether it's the Commonwealth or the state will rely on the other to have done the job and done it well. So I'm fully supportive of them doing the regulations, doing it well, having a really strong system, but only doing it once and not overlapping. And uh, then I assume you'd have to do it all over again in New South Wales and we would, in yeah. Victoria. So we, uh, yeah, that's right. How different are the, the regulations? I mean, isn't, isn't it just a matter of ticking a couple of extra no, boxes? No, 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 no. It's far, far more stringent than that. No, they are effectively separate countries. It's like operating in separate countries. You've got to, you, you, you can't just take one and do this. You, you've got to start again and say, what, how are the regulations framed? What are the particular specifics that uh, they wish and then address those? You know, it's a huge mistake to do anything else. You've got to start and do it properly. And it, it does, um, it, it is expensive system having, uh, having a state-based system. But my main point isn't that. Main point, if I do it in New South Wales or do it in Queensland or in uh, Western Australia, I only wish to do it once. I don't then want to repeat it federally. Uh. Okay, time to go to questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone uh, and a camera onto you. Um, we also will be having questions coming in from Twitter and uh, the chat roll. No, not yet? Okay. Um, so, yes, if you have a question, please raise your hand and, uh, and we'll get the microphone over to you. In the meantime, let's, um, let's bring out the crystal ball. Paul, where is this all leading on an international scale? I think it's leading to, to, to what are likely to be very significant changes in the global energy mix. Uh, an obvious point is we were talking earlier about the US moving towards energy independence, reducing oil imports to zero. That raises important questions about what will the impact of that be on US policy. Uh, there are schools of thought that says if the U.S. is not importing oil anymore, it will lose interest in policing the sea lanes, for example. 
um, which frankly is, a, is nonsense because superpowers police sea lanes, that's what they do. But nonetheless, that people are thinking about this. People are also saying, well, of course, if, if the US is not dependent on Middle East oil imports, it will lose interest in what goes on in the Middle East. Now, again, I think that's a very dubious argument. First of all, the US imports very little from the Middle East anyway. And secondly, US foreign policy has not had a great deal to do with oil. But these are the sort of geopolitical dimensions that are emerging more recently with the events in Crimea and Ukraine. All of a sudden, European governments are now getting very, very enthusiastic about looking what might be done to develop shale gas and have a shale gas revolution as a means of reducing dependence on Gazprom. So there's all sorts of things that will change as a result of what's been going on. Uh, certainly in the case of the UK, uh, they had a, a respite uh, with respect to imports during the North Sea oil yep. uh, era, but the, the, that's come to an end. Well, it's not, it's not ended suddenly, but it's certainly on decline. And actually, the domestic gas supplies in the UK have fallen very significantly. Mm. Um, they've come off very sharply, mm. which means that the, U the UK has now started to become a, a, a serious importer of gas. And again, this carries all sorts of geopolitical implications. David, your crystal ball into Australia's future. Well, I think the, you know, and I, I was in Asia last week, uh, which was a great experience, and I think there are two massive issues that um, are facing Asia, and Australia can play a, its role. One is security of supply for energy, and I was in Korea and Japan uh, with the trade delegation, and both of them are saying very clearly that they would like Australian um, energy supplies and they want to be confident that we'll deliver them, and we, they want to be confident we can deliver them at a reasonable price. So both of them are, are really, really looking to us to, um, to help them in that way and unlock the trade flows. Um, the second thing I think that's, it, it was very interesting sitting in Seoul trying to get back last, last week, um, no airplanes could land in Korea uh, that particular night because of the smog that was coming uh, from the Gobi de Desert picking up uh, the pollution in the air and coming over to Seoul. So it was completely smogged in. Um, on, uh, that was on Tuesday night, and it happens quite regularly, apparently. And so the, I think the second thing that the, we've got to tackle, if, energy, if security supply is the first thing, is moving to a, a situation where we reduce our carbon footprint in Asia. And how we do that and how we pull the four levers, including the efficiency of number five, is going to be extremely important. Um, and so my vision is that we do find a way through this whereby we can, uh, as Australia, we can help Asia both in its security of supply issues and also in moving to a lower carbon footprint. And I think that, that's a, a tremendous opportunity for this country for the long term. We have a question down the front here. Have we got a camera? Uh, John O'Brien from Australian Cleantech and the Premier's Climate Change Council. Um, gas has positioned itself really well as, as that transition fuel for the low carbon economy. Um, with increasing renewable energy penetration and, and decreasing energy storage costs, is there a concern in the industry that the, the transition time might be, uh, might be less than the life of the reservoirs? Um, I think that would be a great outcome if we did achieve that. But um, I think it's interesting just to look at... Um, uh, this state in South Australia, where we've been producing a lot of gas for about 40 years. Um, South Australia has an emissions intensity, which is about 0.62 tons per megawatt hour. Australia is about 0.86 tons per megawatt hour. So we're, we're already well below in this state. The reason we're well below is because there's a successful combination of uh, renewables and gas. Probably don't realize that at night in South Australia, 60% of our electricity on the wires comes from renewables. That is very, very similar at, at, uh, at peak. That's very, very similar to what Germany is doing, and they're always held up as the, um, as the sort of um, highest number. So we're very similar to Germany. 27% of our energy in this state comes from, from renewables um, on the sort of an average basis. So I think the, 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 the skill here is to combine uh, gas, which has the ability to be switched on and off quickly, uh, with uh, renewables, which obviously suffer from uh, the problems of being 24-7, uh, 365 days a year, until we crack the storage issues, which is still expensive. But I think if we're intelligent um, and we get the, they pull the levers correctly, 
we can significantly lower our emissions. And in this state, my vision would be we'd get it down below 0.4 tons per megawatt hour from our current 0.65 if we pull those emissions, um, those levers correctly. And that would be a great achievement, frankly. We'll never get to Tasmania, of course. They're, they're all hydro, uh, so they'll knock us out of the water. But at least we can get to a state where we can, uh, a position where we can start to talk about being a low emission state or a lower emission state, and I'd love to do that. Question down the front here. Uh, just a moment. Uh, we've got the can. Thank you. Uh, Matteo Savillo, uh, I work in state development in the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Thank you, gentlemen, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I think the, the question of property rights, as always, is, is really so interesting. And, and, and Paul, I think you beginning your presentation by saying, you know, speaking as an economist, was, was fascinating. I recall an instance, in, I believe it was Dakota, where there was um, an example of, of, of a local fracking firm contaminating the town's water supply. And the town brought a claim to the local court uh, to be compensated to some extent, seeking almost a Kosian solution, the court ruled in favour of the firm. And this made me think of other examples such as, I think, uh, uh, you know, the scramble for sovereignty for Arctic energy, something like the dispute between Turkey, Greece and Cyprus off the Aegean mm. and Mediterranean seas. How intractable do you think this issue of property rights is, particularly when comparing uh, the United States and Europe? Um, and David, your experience of something like the subterranean Cooper Basin that straddles multiple state boundaries, uh, in, in Australia, to what extent has, has this question of how to negotiate this and negotiate the question of property rights impeded your efforts to unlock these resources? Uh, the, the property rights issue is an extremely important one in terms of the shale gas story. Um, in the United States, and this is a terrible generalisation because there are many exceptions, but generally speaking, the subsoil gas, the subsoil hydrocarbons are the property of the landowner. Um, whereas in Europe, they are the property of the state. Now, the difference that makes is if, you, if I'm a, a landowner on the Marcellus and you come to me and say, can I mess up your backyard? And when it gets to the fracking stage, it's like the circus coming to town. I will say with great pleasure, and here are my bank account details, because if you find any gas, then I actually own it. Whereas in a European context, you come to me and say, can I mess up your backyard? And by the way, uh, the benefits will go to the state, you're going to get a very, a very different response. So from that point of view, property rights are an issue. They also are, of course, in you citing the East Mediterranean, uh, they're also an issue when it comes to cross-border uh, issues. Although that sort of thing can actually help to reduce conflict. There's all of a sudden an incentive for Cyprus to get its act together and to do some sort of a deal between Greece and Turkey, because that way the gas reserves will be, or the gas resources will be developed and there will be revenue involved. David, your deposit in the Cooper Basin straddles, what, three states? Uh, yes, uh, well, it, 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 oil and gas doesn't respect any country boundaries, of course, and globally this does cause issues. Um, uh, obviously there are there's some key flashpoints. We're involved in one between Bangladesh and India right now. You know, and these, th these things take a very long time to sort. But here in Australia, um, equally, it doesn't respect state boundaries, but um, it's absolutely not an issue for us state boundaries in any way. And it's also uh, in our experience of coming onto people's land as we increasingly um, come into, um, into view, because obviously the Cooper Basin is fairly out of view, as we come into view onto um, higher, increasingly higher quality farmland, cattle country, and possibly moving into, into good quality farmland. The key thing when we deal with landowners um, and farmers in particular is we treat them with respect. We don't come onto anybody's land without their support and permission. And ultimately, as Paul says, we compensate them well. And uh, at the end of the day, you, you, you've got to recognize you do have to have a good compensation system, uh, one that uh, reflects um, the, um, the challenges that are obviously experienced by the owners from us coming on the land. There is disturbance, clearly. There is about 1% of the land, probably, that we do occupy while we're there. So you have to compensate them for that. But above all, the key thing for getting on someone's land is do they trust you? And if they do, then you can gain access. And that trust has to be earned every single day by the way you and your staff behave. Um, it's not just about um, compensation. It's also about how you actually behave on the, on the ground. And uh, we work very hard at that. And today we have about 700 agreements um, in Queensland and we have about 40 agreements in New South Wales. And obviously we've been operating the Cooper Basin for the last 40 or 50 years, so we've got plenty of agreements here. So if you behave and you do it well, then you gain access. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid uh, we're out of time. So um, this has been a special presentation. 
on behalf of CEDA and RIOS, and I'd like you to give a big round of applause, please, to David Knox and Paul Stevens. Thank you.